Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 13. Uh, we're continuing looking at the life of David, and tonight we're looking at the life of David from the concept of God recorded seasons of David's life. And I want you to think about this, that David was seeking God through each season of life. And, and the key to it is revealed to us. The key to him seeking God in every season is revealed to us in the New Testament. It's the inspired commentary looking back, the Holy Spirit inspiring uh, the, the New Testament, Luke, to record what Paul said, looking 3,000 years back from where we are now, 1,000 years from then, and seeing what glued or stitched or knitted together David and attached him to seeking God in every season of his life. But let's look at the, first of all, the inspired postscript, I call it, to the life of David. That's in Acts 13, 22. The Holy Spirit directed Paul to say two amazing truths. Starting in verse 22, the first thing in Acts 13, 22, Paul writes that David served God's purpose in his own generation. Now that's what's so amazing. Each of us are here for a purpose. Each of us have a choice to serve the purpose God put us in this time. Remember, from God's perspective, he could have sent us, you know, could have dropped us in any century. I, I mean, we, we are so myopic. We just think about us right now. God grants conception. God sends people into this world, and he sends them and gifts them with a purpose for him in that generation. And David, look, look how beautifully it's said, and when he had removed him, that's Saul, he raised up for them, that's Israel, David as king, to whom also he gave this testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And, and what, what was it that was so powerful about David's life? Keep going to verse 36. It's this, same chapter, verse 36. David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, David wanted to do God's will. And God had a purpose for him to serve in his generation. And David did it. Not perfectly, not completely, not constantly. And that's why I think most of us don't realize that 12% that of the Bible is about David. 12%. That's huge. You have a 12% stake in anything. You are very great in your stakeholding in that venture. David's big because he showed us. That, look again at verse 36. After he served his own generation by the will of God. That, that, that concept that, that God placed him in his generation, God had a purpose and he served it, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. And then it goes on that Christ didn't see any corruption. But that concept, think of the two pieces. Paul writes, David served God's purpose in his own generation. And then Paul notes earlier in verse 22 that this was a man after God's own heart. That phrase is perhaps the best known description of David, the man after God's own heart. Being after God's own heart is deep within all of our hopes. I mean, we all kind of down deep, we wouldn't really say it publicly because it's kind of scary, but all of us hope that we're after God's heart. We, we want to please him so much. But Davis gives us an inspired clue to what it takes to be after God's own heart. To serve God's purpose equals to be after God's own heart. To do what God wants us to do in our generation is being after God's own heart. That's, it's, it's not like you have to raise sheep or something. You just want to serve God. And if we can learn what God has purposed for us to do for him in our lifetime, that pleases him. And our life will be after his own heart. It's not just the people who become famous in history that are great to God. It's the people that are serving and, and his servants and do what he wants. Life has seasons, much like the seasonal changes we watch around us each year. Spring is like youth. Summer is so much like our adulthood. Fall is like the height of our careers. I, I, was, I was sharing with the kids. I love the, the autumn splendor. 
It's just like, I mean, the, the soybean fields are, are dustily being, you know, all harvested. The corn is, is coming out like a golden river into those big trucks. I mean, it's just amazing. The, the bounty of autumn, it's, it's the pinnacle of the, I mean, even though there's lots of excitement going on in summer, from the perspective of life, autumn is the crown. It's when everything is just pouring out. And then after the autumn, golden and bright like our careers at their heights, then there's winter's quiet snow when our days slowly fade, kind of like daylight's hours. You know, every day is a little shorter. And it's so much, life is so much like the seasons around us. And each of David's seasons share a common thread. Let me show you what I mean. Now go back to the middle of your Bible, the 70th Psalm. The 70th Psalm. And we're just going to read the, the first four verses. And I thought, you all have been sitting so long, and this train goes a long time till the next stop, which is the new member uh, induction. So why don't we stand together for the 70th Psalm? We're only going to read the, the first, well, I was going to read the first four. We'll just read them all. We're going to read the whole chapter, okay? Psalm 70, follow along. It's one of those shorties, but it's good. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. Now here's the key. This is what sewed together all the seasons of David's life. Verse 4. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you and let those who love your salvation say continually, and look at the end of the fourth verse, let God be magnified. That's the common thread. David wanted God to be magnified in his springtime of youth and in the summertime of his adulthood at the crown, the, the splendor of autumn in his life, and in the short winter days. He just, let God be magnified. But look at his humility, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. What a, what a beautiful confession, purpose. What a beautiful connection that God be magnified in every season of life. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I pray that tonight as we look at the panorama of David's life, thank you that, that you spend a lot of time in your inspired word pointing at this man, and that's for a purpose. It's not accidental, it's not happenstance, it's not a fluke. It's by divine design. You engineered the Bible to profile so much of David. And I pray that tonight, whatever season we're in, we have some in the springtime of youth, we have some in the summer, they're so busy, we have some kind of at the pinnacle of their life, the crown at the height of their earning power, the height of their acuity in every way, and, and we have some that are in those shortening days of winter. We want you to be magnified wherever we are, and you have set a pathway, a, a plan. You've shown us a model through David, that you don't expect perfection. You just want focus on serving you. And I pray you'd get it from us. Bless our time in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. As you're seated, I want to do something interesting tonight. I'm not sure how far we'll get, but with this new schedule, you know, of having, you know, a uh, um, communion baptism night and a question and answer night and a slide night and David night. I think we're going to be in David for about 40 years, you know, about as long as the children of Israel were in the wandering around. But I just thought it'd be fun to just, to just see the panorama of what God gives us these four seasons in David's life. So a panorama of David's life through 31 of his Psalms. There are 31 Psalms that have little, little clues as to when they occurred. And so we can actually chart David's life. We can chart the four seasons, and from each season, he writes a number of psalms. And, and it's beautiful to see the progression. What we see is David's remarkable habit of looking for the Lord wherever he was. 
whether he was in the midst of something hard, something stressful, something dangerous, he made regular, written, long-term investments in God. He wrote down his prayers. He wrote down his meditations. He wrote down his struggles. He wrote down his fears. And that's what's in the Psalms. It's, it's the most amazing chronicle because it's inspired. And, and God said, this is my word. It's alive. It's powerful. And it, it's impactful to us if we'll let it. There's so much growth as we look at the panorama of David's life through the key verses from the Psalms that he penned, most likely in each of these separate stages. And so if we take the time to meditate on these verses and relate them to what's going on at David's life, then whichever stage we're in or we're headed to or someday we'll be in, we have this divine portrait of how David magnify the Lord in the springtime of youth. How, how David magnified the Lord even when he was in the, the time in his life where, where he's like the bees in my hive. You know, I raise honey with the boys and I mean, don't get in their way. They are just, they are busy as bees. They're just flying at warp speed back and forth from that hive. It's a continuous convoy going out and bringing in what is needed. And summertime is like that. And, and many of our years are, are consumed with, with, the older you get, you look back, you say, I could never do that again because I don't have enough strength. That's where David was. And yet he had time for God, to magnify God. And then when he was at the height, when most people decide, oh, I'm going to cash in my chips and I'm going to go enjoy myself, he didn't. He invested heavily for God. And then in those waning, shortening days, he did too. Well, season one, God had David write three psalms from the springtime of his youth. From David's early life at home, he wrote three psalms about the time when he was overlooked, ignored, disliked by his family. Now, we've already covered these. We covered these a month ago. Uh, the, the chronicle, remember how we do this is we look at the record, 1 Samuel 16, 17, and 18 chronicles this period in David's life, those three chapters of 1 Samuel. And, and if you look at those time periods, you see these psalms just fit right in there. The first one is Psalm 19. God became the focus of David's peer pressure instead of any others. And he says in Psalm 19, uh, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So David, as a shepherd boy, seeing the heavens, declaring the glory of God, said, Lord, I want to conform to what you like more than, than what everybody else wants, so I'm going to seek you. Then David... Uh, learned in the 23rd Psalm, we saw this too, that the Lord is all I want. Boy, is that a lesson to learn as a youth. Remember now the Lord, thy creator, in the days of thy youth, Solomon, David's son, said. This is the time to learn that the Lord's expectations, not my peers, is what I live for, and that the Lord can satisfy me in his time, not me working things out, taking them into my own hands. Then Psalm 132 is David. We're not sure if he wrote this when he was a little boy or looking back, but, but he talks about in Psalm 132 his relationship with the Lord. I believe it's postured of him out in the fields thinking of going with his family to see the Lord's tabernacle, which was a real high time in his life. So in season one, David wrote three psalms from the springtime of his youth about focusing on God, letting God satisfy him, and, and, and just thinking about the wonder of coming into God's presence. Secondly, season two. Kind of sounds like a television show, doesn't it? Second season, you know. Uh, season two, the God of the Bible had David write 18 psalms. This, if you know anything about, the, there's 31, this is the mother load. Now this is what's amazing. From David's most desperate, from David's most, most detached from any scheduled time in his life, from David's life on the run, fearful at times, totally feeling abandoned at times, in the hubbub of, of having all those wives and all those kids, David writes more psalms. In fact, as you look back, sometimes the hardest times in our life are the most fruitful. The hardest times in our life are the times when we were closer to the Lord than at any other time. And so, 
God had David write 18 psalms from the summertime of life. David moved out of his boyhood home and he started life on his own. And, and this time period has more events. And we, we covered them. Event one is David wrote three psalms about when he faced the, the conflict in life from King Saul's wrath. And, and he wrote the 11th psalm and the 59th psalm and the 64th psalm. Then, he, and we covered this, he, we've done each of these individuals, he wrote the 52nd psalm when he lost his job. And he got, he got separated from his family. He moved away because of his job loss to a faraway place. He fled. Actually, he was under duress, and he writes that 52nd Psalm. Then, the third event, David writes two Psalms when he moved to a new location, Gath, enemy territory, and, and, and he was scared to death. Psalm 56 and 34, he writes. It would be kind of like being put in a rugged mountain outpost in Afghanistan, living under, you know, the, the canopy of camouflage, knowing that any projectile will come through it and facing off against hostilities all the time and knowing you're running low on ammunition. That's kind of what Dave was like in Gath. And you remember he had a breakdown. Then, starting in Psalm 13, and let's, let's turn there to Psalm 13 because... We ended there uh, last time in, in the 34th Psalm, and as we go to Psalm 13, we see the beginning of this next era or event of this, this adult season of his life, this summertime of activity, as it were. David writes five Psalms from this time period, Psalm 13, Psalm 40, Psalm 57, Psalm 70 that we read this evening, that little uh, important key verse 4 and all the surrounding verses of that psalm. And also, David writes from this time period, the 142nd psalm. So from this time period, David feels abandoned. He flees to Gath, but he grew while living and working with this hostile group of men. First of all, Psalm 13, look at verse 1. And I'm going to read 1 and then 5 and then 6, and you can just skip along in your Bible. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. That was from David's lowest point. He felt abandoned, and yet he sought God even when he felt abandoned. Psalm 13. Look at Psalm 40. Turn, turn just a few pages over to the 40th Psalm. There's another one from this, this right in the midst of his summertime of activity and, and the crucible of his struggles. But in the 40th Psalm, look at the first two verses. David allowed him, the Lord, to pull him out of the pits of life. You ever go down in the pits? My mom used to call it down in the dumps. There used to be a dump. Now we have transfer stations. There used to be a dump, and that's what it was. You dumped junk there, and there was garbage and flies and stuff burning and broken glass and rusty metal, and we loved it. We scampered around. We used to find all kinds of treasures in the dump. Never realized we could have gotten lockjaw and, you know, whoever else. Well, sometimes we're emotionally in the dumps, and that's where David is in the 40th Psalm. And he allowed the Lord to pull him out of the pits. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock and established my steps. Right in the midst of the summertime of activity, God rescued David. Keep going to the 57th Psalm. It, it, just gets better and better. The 57th Psalm is in this very same time period. And by the way, I'm going through these Psalms chronologically just for you to get this survey of David's life. And in the, the 57th Psalm, David allowed the Lord to lift and focus his emotions upward instead of downward. See, what usually happens is our emotions start getting focused downward. And when they're focused downward, all we see is, is decay and despair and disorder and, and everything is just dark, you know. And the Lord wants to focus us upward. And that's, that's exactly the 57th Psalm. Look at verse 7. I'll read verse 7, 10, and 11. David said in this cave time, 
In fact, if you look at the superscript in Psalm 57, do you see each one of these has the little code in it? Do you see what it says? When David fled from Saul into the cave. This is a cave time. And so he's down. But look how the Lord lifted him. Verse 7. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even when I'm on the run, even when I'm busy, even when I'm down, even when I'm discouraged. I will sing and give praise. He just had his voice. He might have been carrying around his stringed instrument. I doubt it. He's on the run for his life, pursued. You probably don't take your guitar to the desert, but whatever. He is singing from his soul, giving praise to God. Look at verse 10. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens. Your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. You know, I, he's in the cave. The caves are, a lot of these caves are right around the Dead Sea. And you can see the clouds. You can see the Dead Sea. You can see the mountains. It's just, it's just so picturesque if you've ever been there. You can see this. But he allowed the Lord to lift his focus up instead of down. Great lesson. Keep going to Psalm 70 where we were, and I just want to remind you, David wanted the Lord magnified in every era of his life. And that fourth verse, if you haven't yet marked it, this is the theme that ties together the springtime of youth, the summertime of, of all the busyness of, of getting established. And David wanted the Lord magnified in this era and every era. And verse 4, let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. You know what that means? I don't have anything else to be glad in. I don't have anything else to rejoice in. I don't have anything else secure. I don't have anything else that's lasting. I'm separated from my family. I'm separated from my job. I'm separated from my people. His own people were chasing and trying to kill him. And he says, I don't have anything left. I'll rejoice and be glad in you. That's spiritual maturity. In the New Testament, the fruit of the Spirit, joy, is when we detach from our circumstances, our product of happiness and joy. We detach it from our circumstances and attach it to the Lord. Joy is being detached from circumstances. And David detached from circumstances and said, I will rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation. See, he didn't have anything. He, he wasn't even sure he would have his family when this all got over with. He didn't have any possessions at that time. He just had nothing. He says, but this is what I have. I love, verse 4, your salvation. And if you're truly attached to the Lord, if that's all you have, then salvation makes me want God to be magnified. You see how beautiful this is. Keep going to the 142nd Psalm. Chronologically, next, another cave psalm. Keep going to the right. And this is what David says. Again, the superscript uh, says a contemplation of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. David found only God could liberate him from times of depression. That's what the 142nd Psalm is about. Only God can liberate us. Now, we can get short-term help. We can have drugs that, that stabilize us. We can have therapies of different kinds. We can have counselors. And all of those things can stabilize us. The 142nd Psalm gives us the biblical truth. Only God can liberate us from times of depression. Only God. Other things, and, and I'm not opposed to other things, they keep it, they kind of push it back but it's still there. Only God can liberate us. And boy, listen, this is a guy that I would call manic, depressive, bipolar, David. Look at him. Verse 7, Psalm 142. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, and you will deal bountifully with me. A lot of truth there. His soul was imprisoned. He was, he was a captive to his emotions, to his depression, to his, to his low condition. 
Why did he want to be brought out? Because he didn't like it? Because he wanted, you know, to be able to participate in society? No. Those are all byproducts. It's wonderful when that happens. Look what it is. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. You see, he wanted to be liberated to glorify God, not to comfort himself, feel better. It's a wonderful motivation that God responds to so that he gets the credit. Amazing thought to think about that. The righteous shall surround me. That was, remember he was with all those monster men that were, that were all disconsolate and depraved. You know, it was just a bunch, 400 scoundrels were around him. He says, but Lord, when you bring my soul out of prison, I'll praise your name and the righteous are going to surround me instead of this riffraff and you're going to deal bountifully with me. So from this time in David's life, from the pits, he, he writes that. Well, the next thing that happens is Psalm 17, if you want to turn back there. And that's the, the fifth event of his uh, adult life. And Psalm 17 records that fifth event. And in that fifth event, uh, David faced constant insecurities, hu- huge responsibilities. He's, there's 400 men surround him instead of the righteous, and they just start going with him, and they start hiding from King Saul. This is all in 1 Samuel 22 and 23, if you want to know the context. The first four verses are the cave times. That was that fourth event. This fifth event is when David goes on the run, and this is what happens in Psalm 17. Look at the seventh, sixth and seventh verses. David trusted the Lord even when everyone else deserted him. It got down to the point everyone else deserted him, And he says this in the seventh verse of Psalm 17. I've called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. David had no hope of help from anybody left. So he says, by your right hand, your, your covenant loyalty, your loving kindness, the, the Hebrew word is hesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, and it means loving loyalty at a high degree. Mercy, your faithfulness, your loving kindness. It's translated all different ways, but it's a covenant word. He said, God, you made a covenant with me. Stick your right hand to power out. You're the only one left. Help me. Wonderful time. The next event is continuing in 1 Samuel 23 from 15 onward, we get to the 54th Psalm. So go to the right now to the 54th Psalm. By the way, the, the Psalms seem to have been ordered after David's time, most likely by either Hezekiah or by Ezra. We, we you know, Hezekiah probably did it, um, but Ezra probably even more. Um, arranged it. So they're not in any kind of order in the Psalms uh, as far as chronological. That's why we have to jump all over the place. But look at the the 54th Psalm. This is the sixth event of this summertime of David's life, the, the burning hot activity time. David wrote three Psalms, 54 we're at, 35 we're going to, 36 after that, about when he was betrayed by the men he trusted. Not only the men of Keilah, but also the Ziphites from his own tribe. Judah, the whole tribe, the Ziphites, the clan within the tribe betrayed him. And this is what he says in Psalm 54, the sixth and seventh verses. David found out only God could deliver him. He he had fled into the city, he delivered them, and then he was living in the city that he had delivered, and they turned on him. I mean, he had he had risked his life to rescue them, and you can read all this in 1 Samuel 23 and 1 Samuel 24. He did all that and they turned on him. This is what he wrote in the 54th Psalm, 6th and 7th verses. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord. It's good. For he has delivered me out of all my trouble, and my eye has seen his desire on my enemies. So David, from that hard time, instead of complaining about their betrayal, his worship goes up. Now, back to Psalm 35 and 36, because this, this pair of Psalms finds David on the run. He's actually uh, probably in En Gedi because he, he sees the scene in Psalm 36 especially is, is a beautiful scene of what it looks like in En Gedi. That's the little oasis by the Dead Sea. But, but look what he says uh, in, in Psalm 35 in verse 19. 
and then Psalm 36. You can flip over to uh, verse 7. But 35, 19, he says this, Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. So he's saying, Lord, vindicate me. Why did he say that? So he wouldn't take matters in his own hands. That's something we learned from David. He doesn't ever take matters in his own hands. He, he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord always rescues him. When we take matters in our own hands, when we try and get vengeance, that is a byproduct of bitterness. When we start getting embittered, we want to get even. And David wouldn't let bitterness come, so he, look what he says in verse 19 of chapter 35, the 35th Psalm. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. He says, Lord, I don't deserve this. Will you take care of them? Now, look at, at the 36th Psalm. Look at what he says in verse 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Now, he, he, the, he runs up to this. The fifth verse, your mercies, O Lord, are in the heaven. Psalm 36, verse 5. So I picture him standing at En Gedi. And he says, Lord, because when you're at En Gedi by the Dead Sea, the air is so clear, it's so fresh, so beautiful, you can just see the blue sky. So he says, he says, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. That's, that's very high. So is the heavens. So mercy, wow, measureless. Faithfulness, huge. Verse 6. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Do you know all you see in En Gedi? You see the mountains of Judah, and you see across the, 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 Red, the Dead Sea, you see the mountains of Moab. And they're monster mountains. They look like the Himalayas when you're down 17, 13, however many hundred feet below sea level at the shore of the, sea of Gal, or of the Dead Sea. You're about a quarter of a mile down looking up at mountains. They just look huge from that perspective. And look what he says. He says, your righteousness is like the great mountains. Doesn't move, doesn't, doesn't shift, they're just there. And your judgments are a great deep. You know, the, the, the Dead Sea, they didn't know how deep it was. It, it just, it seemed to them like it went down to the center of the earth. And, and so he uses that context to talk about your mercy, verse five, your faithfulness, verse five, your righteousness, verse six, your judgments, verse six. And then he says in verse 7, How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. The only way you can survive by the Dead Sea where he was hiding is in the shadows. It's 125 degrees in the daytime and there's hardly any water. You just don't make it. You have to be in the shadow. And he said, I'm, I'm making it with you. Continuing, he leaves that and goes to Psalm 53. So go to the right. And the 53rd Psalm is, is the next event. He, he actually climbs up the ravine of En Gedi, which is, all of us have heard the book, Brook Kidron and the Gethsemane in Jerusalem. Well, that brook, Kidron, empties into En Gedi. So if you're in En Gedi and you just start walking up the mountain, it's like this, it's called a wadi. It's a valley, a wadi that's carved out by water coming down in the, the spring rains, if you just walk up that, you end up in Jerusalem. And so he's walking up there, headed toward Jerusalem, and on the way he sees the flocks of the richest man in the area. And that's 1 Samuel 25. That's the next event in his life. And he, he gets involved in a business deal. He becomes the protector of Nabal's sheep. And that's 1 Samuel 25. And Nabal, or Nabal, that's a Hebrew word. Nabal is the Hebrew word fool. There are three Hebrew words for fools. Pethi is, is the simple fool, and he just is like a, a door. He just goes with whoever, whoever talks, goes, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. He's just like a, one of those saloon doors that goes like this. That's the simple fool. This is the third word, Nabal. It's the hard-hearted fool. Abigail says that. She says, foolish you are, Nabal is your name. It's a wordplay. But, but look what David writes in the 53rd Psalm. When Nabal cheated David, David and his men, his, his, all those uh, 600 men that ran with him, 400 were in the cave, and then finally he had 600. All of them protected the flocks. They were like a shield between 
the marauders and the, the sheep and shepherds of this wealthy man. And this wealthy man knew he had a, a kind of a factor of how many sheep he'd lose. And one season, he wasn't losing any. And he said, what's going on? And his wife said, well, you know, it's David's out there. And he goes, well, I didn't ask him to do that. Well, someone had appreciated, and they were kind of had this deal. David protected them, and they would feed David. Well, when Nabal heard about that, he said, no, I'm not going to do it. And if you remember, the messenger came back to David, and David, for a moment, 1 Samuel 25 says, he was strapping his sword onto his thigh. In other words, he was getting ready to get even. And David found God was far better than he was at getting even. And in this 53rd Psalm, it's about when someone wrongs us. Either we can get even with them, which is the wrong method, or we can trust the God who says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I'll recompense. And God always does a better job. If you know the story, God gave Nabal a stroke. And he paralyzed. He froze. And a few, three days later, he died. David says, wow, you're better at this than I am, Lord. I would have just chopped him up. And you did it right, and I didn't get in trouble. But look at the fifth verse of the 53rd Psalm. There, there they are in great fear where no fear was for God hath scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. See, in his psalmy talk, he's saying, Lord, you take care of my enemies better than I ever could. Then the next event, if you want to go to the 16th psalm, it's a very, very popular one. And uh, I don't know if we're going to make it through the summer, but we're almost to the end of the summer. So look at Psalm 16. There are 18 psalms in this time period of David's life, the most prolific time. But in the 16th Psalm is a part of two Psalms David wrote when he suddenly lost his family, his friends, and finances. This is now we've gotten to 1 Samuel 30. And this is Ziklag. David finally had gotten moved from the ball and he had, had, had the Philistines gave him a city and, and he set up shop with all of his wives and all of his kids and all of his friends, all of the 600 of them, and they all were living in their own city and they had all their flocks and, and he was getting back in business and it was doing really well. And all of a sudden, as he was out at work one day, when he came home and, and came over the rise and looked down at the pleasant valley where he lived, everything was on fire. And the more he looked, he saw everything there was death and destruction and burning and everything had been messed up and there wasn't anyone left alive. And his wife and children were gone. He thought they were dead. So this is the, this is the most frightening time in his life. And what David finds is his family, his friend, his finances, everything was lost. That's First Samuel 30. Look what he says in Psalm 16. This, this most likely, this is a very beautiful psalm. It's most likely from this period. This is what he says in verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Even in the most desperate time, and then you know how the psalm, psalm 16 ends, you'll show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's reminding himself that the Lord is the only one that can help him. David found God was his safest investment for life. He says, the Lord's at my right hand. I won't be moved. The Lord's always before me. You're what's important. Then he writes the 39th Psalm. Keep going. Same time period. Uh, Ziklag time is the 39th Psalm, and in the 39th Psalm, look at verses 4, 5, and also 7. David found when he was weak, God is always strong. Do you notice how beautiful it was this morning when we were singing? Everybody likes that song. And it, we were singing out, you know, you are my strength when I am weak. That's David's song. And, and look at Psalm 39, verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end. What is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am, how weak I am? Now look at verse 5. Certainly every man at his best is but a vapor. Verse 7. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. You are my strength when I'm weak. You are the treasure. Everything has been taken away from me. My family, everything I ever hoped for is gone. But I'm going to hope in you. Well, I'll just read this. The third season, season three, 
God had David write six psalms from the autumn time of his life. That's his strong years at king, as king. He's just ablaze in power and glory, amassing more gold than anybody's ever gotten on this planet in history. David had the corner on gold. He had, he had a million talents of silver and a hundred thousand talents of gold. A talent has two measures, 60 pounds, 100 pounds. You have 100,000, 100 pound blocks of gold, you're doing really well. You have a million, 100 pound, 100 million pounds of silver? What is silver these days? 30 some an ounce, that's $500 a pound. You have $500 million just in silver, half a billion in real, not in paper. Unbelievable. Autumn time, David's strong years. He writes six psalms. He writes from this time period, Psalm 38, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, that's from his sin. Then he writes Psalm 3, 31 and 63. That's about the consequences to his sin. And finally, part four, season four, God had David write four psalms from the winter time of his life, from his waning years. And that's where we started this, this whole recap in Psalm 18. Then Psalm 71. Boy, that's a good psalm. That's the old timer psalm about how to grow old in godliness. Then Psalm 23, which we know so well. I'm sure David was repeating that at the end. And then Psalm 116. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. David sought God in every season of life. And so should we. Let's all stand for a word of prayer. And as we stand, before we move on to our induction of new members, let's ask the Lord to help us to magnify him. Whether you're in the season of springtime and you just have youth, you've got everything. Or you're in the summertime and it seems like you aren't going to be able to keep up. You're at the height of your activity. Or maybe you're in that time period between 50 and somewhere in the mid and upper 60s where you're at the peak. You have more time, wealth, and wisdom than you've ever had in your life. Or you're on the shortening winter time. Doesn't matter where we are. David said, I'm going to magnify you. Youth, adulthood, prime, downhill. I'm going to magnify you. God works in every season of life. Let's ask him and invite his grace upon us. Father, thank you for David. Thank you for his life. Thank you for recording just so much of it and putting a frame around 31 Psalms so we can see the prayers of this incredible man that you found would serve your purpose. You found that, that he would do your will. A servant is someone who does the will of another. You want us to be your servants. That's doing your will. And Lord Jesus, you told us in that prayer that we're supposed to find to be our continuous framework every time we approach you. That framework says, control me, lead me. That I want your kingdom to come on my life and I want your will to be done as you lead me through my life. Oh Lord, may you be magnified as we surrender to your will. Bless us now as we welcome in these two precious new members. Help us to see that this church is alive. It's an organism. It's a body. It's full of life. And you have a purpose for each individual part of this body, each of us. May we with all our heart, want to do your will. Like David, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.